Uh, as some of you may know me, I'm Sean Murphy, one of the directors here at My Mortgage Freedom. Um, we we put this together simply because we keep having the same conversations with with clients um, every day without fail. Um, what's happening with rates? Um, you know, what is there any validation to say that we're going to approach a peak anytime soon? Is there any validation to say we might be going down soon? These questions. So I just thought we compile it all together and put out um, put it out to a group. We got a really strong feedback as well to to show the amount of interest that people have in this topic because the reality is that no one does know. Um, there's far too many variables that could play out, but as we could see on the way up, no one really no one really was able to grapple exactly how bad of a state um, the, the global economy was. So uh, we'll get stuck into it just so we can use the time as best we can. I'm going to start with um, looking at the agenda. So the agenda is simply looking at whether or not we've peaked, when are we going down? And one of the big ones is to fix or not to fix when rates do come down because everyone everyone got stuck, um, you know, kicking themselves because they didn't get into a fixed rate at the right time or maybe they're in a fixed rate now and they're coming out of it and they're a little bit worried about what that's going to look like. Um, the other thing is, is it a good time to buy or sell? If you're an investor, is it a good time to cash in on some of that growth that you got over the 2020 to 2022 period? Um the other thing is what are people doing to manage repayments, especially we've got a few guys in the in the webinar tonight that are professional services. So what are people doing to manage the cash flow just to you know keep their head above water during the, the tricky times? Um, what we'll do is we'll cover have we peaked first. So a, this is a really interesting point because when I say no one knows, we can only look at the indicators. One of the biggest things that we saw just here, just now recently in August is that China their year-on-year -year inflation that was released in uh, that was released or sorry calculated for June has recently been released that it's zero percent. That is like that is insanely positive for our outlook, and it's also really positive for the New Zealand outlook. And although it may look like New Zealand don't necessarily have a direct correlation with us, we both do with China. And whether we like it or not, that is the case. And this is good news for us. So the problem is New Zealand versus Australia, aggressive versus passive. New Zealand went hard. They went early and they probably are going to be the ones that were that, you know, their, their prime minister was flogged for it at the time, but they're probably the ones who are going to now be at their peak. With Australia, we were a little bit more passive in the beginning. We were a little bit, um, we were a little bit more, sort of reluctant to increase interest rates, especially when um, the, the the chair of the Reserve Bank had made a commitment not to increase rates until into 2024. Um, it was a silly commitment that he ended up eating his words over. But the reality is we did wait too long. The writing was on the wall that our inflation was getting out of control and we didn't move as early as New Zealand. Neither did the UK, but the US did. The New Zealand and um, US chart looks very similar. The Australian and the UK chart looks very similar. We, we went a bit later. They went early. They're probably at their peak. We are maybe not. How many more? I would not suggest that there's going to be any more than two if there are further rate rises. Now, that, that prediction is simply based on the industry commentators I follow. Um, I follow industry commentators that don't have a don't have an agenda typically don't have businesses and they're not representing um, banks or institutions, but unfortunately they are some of the better ones that are representing banks and institutions. And I'll cover off on what they think um, in, a, in a little bit, but I wanted to look at, before we go over when we go down, I wanted to have a look at this, what I was just explaining. This graph here is showing us exactly what New Zealand did with their reserve bank uh, cash rate versus Australia. Now we were starting from a lower a lower point. We were at point one. They were a little bit higher up above us. <clears throat> but you can see there, New Zealand, they started launching their interest rates in September 2021. That was a very bold move. It was also a move that they saw was going to help them in the long run. We're now at the end of that long run. And they are, they're probably going to be the ones that are going to go down a little bit earlier than us. So is it relative? Yeah, probably we got to stay at that lower rates for a little bit longer, but we're also going to now stay at higher rates for longer. Is there a right or wrong answer? We're, we're going to find out. We took different policies on it, but this explains, and this sort of gives you a graphic understanding of exactly 
how it's going to how it's potentially going to play out. Look how long it took us to get from those from those um, bottoms to the current tops that we're at. It took you know 15, 16 months. So we can't expect to go down in four months or five months or six months. I think it's going to take time. And given that our our inflation is is you know they're suggesting that it's peaked. A lot of people see that in the news and they're like, what the hell, what the hell does it even mean though? The reality is it doesn't necessarily make a massive difference to your individual life as to whether or not inflation is 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 peaking or not, right? These government, the the government policymakers and the the um economists that work for them are the ones that are going to be making the calls. All we can do is keep our head down, bum up, and really keep sort of pushing forward and monitoring as best we can. But the reality is if they knew it was coming, they would have warned us. If they knew how bad it was going to get, they would they would have warned us. The reality is they didn't, and they really don't know what's more than a couple of months, um, a couple of months into the future. And graphs like this that show you how quickly it got out of control sort of validate that that they really don't have a have a you know a good grappling hand over exactly how the how the how the future is going to unfold. So moving on to when we come down, my personal opinion is that we will not come down until at least after Easter next year. So if we look at this and we look at how long it took us to get here, we can't back out now and sort of unwind all of the hard work and the pain that we put the population through. People are obviously bleeding because of the cost of everything, the the cost of um, everyday essential items are, is out of control. You know, it's 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 got to the point where everyone in the country is feeling the pinch and feeling the pain. And we don't want this to last more than, you know, a couple of years. And that's generally what happens. If you look at 19, in the early 1990s recession, it was a couple of years of, of really max pain, but employment was a lot more difficult. So it was harder to find work. It was harder to find income. In the GFC, similar thing. There was a two year recovery period from the absolute crash. Whereas, this scenario hasn't been a an instance where there was a crash. It has been a slow bleed. So I think this one's going to take a little bit longer than the two year fix because it took you know 18, 18 to 24 months to unwind. So it's probably going to take something similar to, to get us back to a point where we're beginning to grow. And one of the questions I've grappled with that I really don't have an educated uh, educated guess for is... Is today's prices of everyday items the new norm? Will we ever see a retracement? Will we see the the price of every you know your, your milk, your eggs, the, the, all of this everyday stuff? Petrol, for example, oil prices they retraced. They retraced all the way back to eighty bucks a barrel. But unfortunately, the fuel prices for some reason still stayed at two dollars, two dollars twenty or two dollars thirty, depending what day it is. So. Are we being conditioned to to believe that today's prices are the new prices, and we just have to get used to it? Because you think about all those all those historical moments where, at some point, it was it was not normal to pay those prices, and then it became normal. So it's it's going to be a, a watch this space. Um, and like I said, I don't think we're going anywhere until at least uh, Easter or after Easter. The major banks are spread between around April next year into December. So one of their major banks said that the first rate cut will not be until December. I think that will break people's bank accounts hardcore. I don't think people will be able to hold on to this for that much longer. Um, that's another, you know, fourteen odd months. It's it's not very uh, it's not very likely. One of the other questions that we get, and Peter, feel free to to ask any questions if you've got any along the way, and I'll I'll try and knock them out at the end. Um, just so as we move through the four topics, um, we can we can record them as we go. One of the other questions that we get is to fix or not to fix. The 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 response to that is do not fix too early. What happened in 2017 was every, the, the fixed rate started dropping before the variable rate started dropping and everyone started fixing. There was 3.99% and 4.99% plastered on the back of every every bus and all throughout the, uh, the media and everyone started going to fix. But if you notice what happened at that time, the fixed rates were all for um, three years. They were all for three years. 
this is what I expect to happen this time. I expect fixed rates to start being advertised over the next sort of six or so months as the go-to go to home loan product. And if you fix in the next six months, you're fixing until 2026, even into 2027. Now, if you're going to go back and fix, I think someone's going to have the balls to launch a... Um, to launch a, a 4.99 and that's going to attract a lot of attention because they're going to probably go out and they're, they're basing that on the fact that the bond markets are going to start coming down. Like I've said, they're in the, in the dot points like WTF are bonds. It doesn't necessarily matter, but the bond markets are generally correlated to fixed rates. Now I wanted to show you what happened in uh, what, oh, sorry, the, the 2017 trap is potentially getting primed to happen now. This graph here, if you look over at the bottom left hand, you've got October, 2021. That was the moment that we were warned that financial markets were about to become a shitstorm. In October 2021 was when they started to, to rally up. Now, the bond markets, they, like I said, they effectively assist in pricing the fixed rates, not the variable rates. The, the Reserve Bank cash rate prices that. Now, if we look up all the way into that future, you could have still, you could have still fixed your home loan in around June 2022. Uh, which was just over a year ago, you could have probably fixed your home loan in around 5.5%. Now, what happened was we started to think that they were going to start to come down. If you look at the, if you look over towards the right where the trail ends, the trail of candles ends, just before that, it looked like we were starting to come down and all the banks started releasing really low um, three-year fixed rates. They even got as low as the variable rate at the time. Now, it would have been insane for anyone to fix at that point because you are effectively showing, the, the market is showing you that you are fixing at the peak. And what we want to try and encourage everyone to do now is to hold on, hold on because we need to see this happen. We need to see those, we need to see those candles start to make their way back down to two and a half percent. When they get to two and a half percent, where you can see on the on the right hand side, that is when you can see that the market has made a made a real reversal. And I would not look at fixing all of it. You would look at fixing a portion, because the variable rates typically follow the fixed rates by up to six to eight months, depending on depending on these markets and what happens. But these are the things that we're monitoring on a on a daily basis to try and prevent anyone from fixing too early because fixing too early is going to cost you an absolute bomb. Um, I, I hope it, I hope it makes sense and I'm going to put some, uh, some notes together and put a blog up on the website just so each section can be dot pointed um, because this video will be available as well. Uh, if you wanted to, to rewatch or show it with anyone else or share it with anyone else. As we move off the interest rate, um, the interest rate conversation for a minute. Is it a good time to buy or sell? This is, as we know, it's it's plastered on every every newspaper on every Monday morning. We've got low stock levels, clearance rates are really strong, but there's no stock. So, is it a real reflection of what the market looks like at the moment? Far too difficult to tell. People are still pro property. People are still aggressive when it comes to property. You go to the auctions. You go the people. In a, in a shitty property market, people don't go to auction. Vendors don't go to auction. You look at Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, even Perth now have joined the joined the race. They're running auctions. Nearly most sales are auctions. Very few are private sales because they've got the confidence they're going to have enough buyers to create the demand to sell the property at a price that is going to be suited for auction. So it's pretty scary to think that that's the case, but the reality is that's the evidence that keeps presenting itself every single weekend, week in, uh, week, in week out. So <clears throat> lower stock. There are, however, less buyers because servicing sucks. The affordability of a couple, let's say you've got a family couple with two kids, they're both on 90 grand each, and 18 months ago, they could borrow $800,000. Their borrowing capacity is probably below 600 now. It is insane because the banks have increased the living expense benchmarks naturally because the living expenses have gone bananas. And they've also increased the servicing rate. Now the servicing rate just means if I'm going to give you a home loan at 5%, then you, I need to make sure you can afford to pay that back at seven and a half percent because the rates have become 
so expensive, they're servicing home loans at like nine and a half percent. So you need to basically, if you had a hundred K worth of income and your home loan was 500 grand, more than $25,000 worth of your 100K income has been eaten up by interest rate rises. So it's very difficult for buyers to compete with larger purchase prices. And it's kind of fulfilling its own fulfilling its own destiny by the serviceability is presenting less buyers to market, which means it's not pushing the market up as much as it could if they could get easy access to cash. So do I think it's a good time to buy? Yes, I do depending on what you're doing. If you're an owner-occupier, it is a great time to upgrade the home simply because we just don't have that competition where there's multiple emotional buyers coming to a property every every weekend. Where you had 45 people lining up to get in, you've now got seven. It's a far smaller pool of competition. When you look at an investment, it is always a good time to invest because typically as a property investor and as one of our clients, everything is long, long game. We don't, we don't play short game stuff unless you're an experienced property flipper. Um, we'll support that 100%, but we don't like people trying to get rich quickly through property uh, because generally you're buying in risky markets and we, we prefer to play the long game, play the game where, you, where your numbers stack up and your investments are, are sound and they aren't going to... You're not going to risk sort of upsetting the apple cart and bringing your bringing your portfolio progress down into the uh, into the downward um, direction. It's just not our not our thing. So as an investor, it is always a good time to buy because you want to buy a you want to buy your properties or offload your properties in very variable markets. If it's a thirty year game that you're playing, where you're going to be buying and selling, say six properties, maybe five properties in that thirty years, because you can't. You generally don't hold on to the same property for thirty years. You would usually hit a glass ceiling in that suburb, or you would be really grateful for your profit in that area. You could potentially then offload that property and go and in, invest into an into the next growth or the next ripple suburb or whatever it might be. So investment very different. Owner occupier. I'm very confident that right now you would find better options than what you'll find in a in a competitive market. As an investor, always comes back to the numbers. Always. This is why the investor stock needs, yeah, you need to be very careful with the investor stock at the moment. You need to be careful of subpar stock. Everyone is offloading their shit first. Everyone is going to offload what they don't want, what their poorest performing property is. They're all going to get rid of that first. They're not going to get rid of their good stock. They're not going to get rid of their home or anything like that. If things get tight, they're going to get rid of the worst property first. So be careful of subpar stock. Get your building and pest inspections done. You, you know, all of those little little bits of due diligence that you don't want to miss um, because you don't want to get um, sold a lemon. This is very interesting. The uh, Actually, it's just a boring graph, but the, the, the data on it is very interesting. The quarterly change in property across the country, New South Wales is the first one, Victoria, New Queensland, South Australia, WA. I'm just looking at the dark blue lines or dark purple, which is the capital cities. We've seen growth in the quarterly, um, in the in the sorry, since the um, last quarter in every single city except for uh, Hobart. Now that's pretty pretty impressive considering we just come off what was a what was effectively an eighteen month surge in interest rates. Now we're looking at potential growth over those cities of you know is look at look at Queensland and New South Wales at nearly 4%. That's insane. That's nuts to show that there is that much buyer demand in those areas. But when we go across to this page here, I've just zoomed out to the annual change. So yes, Hobart over here might look like it's only down, you know, not even 1%. That's for the quarter. You look at it for the year, it's still down more than 10% and going further. Just in the last quarter, it was down another one. It's already down 10, probably going to go further. I don't see that changing because Hobart went bananas in 2021-22. Um, I think there's more room for correction. Look at New South Wales and Victoria, the regional areas. Over the year, they're down, you know, between what's that, seven and seven and nine percent, seven and eight percent. But the cities over the year, because of this recovery over the last two quarters. Is actually only a very small amount for Victoria and Sydney's back up. So it shows how resilient the market has been in what was effectively 
A, the craziest 27% increase over two years. And then B, we've gone 15, uh, 15 months in a row, sorry, 13 rate rises essentially in a row, and we've still got growth. So that it's sort of uh, it's sort of concerning to say that the market is going to continue to go down because we're just not seeing the evidence at the moment. I would love for it to, but it hasn't hasn't shown any uh, any evidence of that. Uh, being mindful of time that it's twenty past six or twenty two past six, I'm just going to whip through these for any of you or any of you, your friends, your family, your clients. These are some of the ideas that people are doing to try and improve their cash flow at the moment because. It's, it's getting difficult to keep your investments in positive cash flow. I, I would say nearly all of them now are in negative cash flow. You're forking out for that, forking out for a bigger mortgage, forking out for higher expenses of everyday living. Um, not to mention the every man his dog that went to Europe this year, that trip would have been insanely expensive trip. So these are some things you can do to put some cash back in your pocket. Switching to interest only. It's really not that bad. Yes, your rate goes up a small margin, but your repayments can come down by, by you know, depending on your loan size, hundreds of dollars a month. This could reverse essentially, you know, three or four rate rises, and it just could take that sting out of your out of your your budget pressure for a short period of time. If you only need to do it for six months, only do it for six months. If you only need to do it for 12 months, you can do it for only 12 months. There's no limits. You can switch back to principal and interest whenever you please. But if you're struggling, you need to potentially do these things to, to keep your head above water so that you can hold on to your portfolio and keep it intact until we move into the better times next year and you can really springboard into some growth phases. Taking cash out of the property, a lot of people have actually started taking, you know, 10 grand out, taking five grand out, taking whatever they whatever they need to just to have a family buffer. And let's say the repayment's gone up by $1,000 a month on the mortgage. What they're doing is they're taking out 12 grand or 24 grand, setting themselves up, say, I can live the way I was and I can just deal with the living um, cost of living increases. My home loan, Yes, I'm going to use some equity. Yes, I am going to then owe more on my home. But the idea is that the interest and the cost of repaying that is going to be far less than either A, offloading the property or B, not having the growth that that property is going to produce over the long term. So short-term pain, long-term gain, just to keep your cash flow um, in, in good check. The other thing is um, reducing the home loan limit. If people have funds in offset, some people like to hold hold savings. Don't be don't be afraid to put that into the into the home loan and reduce the limit to reduce payments temporarily. You can always take it out again later when things get better. Um, debt recycling. If you've got any any intention to buy investment properties, you definitely want to make sure that you're not using your own cash. Always take out equity of your own home to put into the investment property. So you're maximizing your deductible debt and minimizing your non-deductible dead money debt. Very, very important. Um, you can chat to the broker about how to set that up. It's super simple. And yeah, because you can't undo accidentally using your own money for an investment. That's once it's done, um, it's like that for the long term. So in summary rates, yep, I think there could still be a little bit left in the tank, not too much. Um, we've done most of the hard work. So yeah, prepare for another year of uh, of, of you know tight, tightening the, the purse strings and just being conscious of where your money's going or, and coming from. I don't suggest a fix. Buy or sell, depends on the quality. Be very, very careful of that. Um, there's some good opportunities out there, but don't, uh, yeah, don't, there's nothing needs to be done hastily at the moment. And cash flow is king, so protecting it just to just to get through the next sort of twelve to eighteen months, and fingers crossed we can we can all get to the other side and um, blue skies and rainbows. I'm sure it'll be challenging, but hopefully we can uh, we can get there. A couple of last things: we have launched a new website, so you can now book your broker directly from the website. You don't have to contact the mail um, at my MF email or anything like that. You can go straight to the website, choose your broker, and book in a call. Or you can just pop in a pop in an email um, request to be called back. You can also subscribe. Actually, all you guys are already on the mailing list, so you're all good there. And we have a referral campaign running from um, September to March next year, where we're going to send two people away to Italy. I'm sure you've already heard about that, but that that page is also live on the website where you can refer friends or yourself to refinance. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's one of you guys that wins that in March next year. That'll be awesome. 
and rate tracker as if you're not connected to rate tracker don't stress we are currently going through the process of upgrading it so that the quality of data is is a lot better the precision of the interest rate collection is far better and we'll be rolling that out you will hear about it for sure um that is it from me thank you and um i hope that was of some value did anyone have any any questions before we all uh, let you go and have your dinner and relax for the evening. Very good. That is all good. Have a good night. Um, reach out if you need anything or if you need any clarification on any of that. And just as you as you know, none of that was uh, intended for financial advice that relates to your individual circumstances. That was just general opinions based on my industry experience. So I hope you did get some value out of it, and uh, you can yeah share it with uh, share it with friends, and family. If you found it valuable, and come back to me if you've got any questions. Have an awesome night, and we'll chat to you very soon.